，我们敦促美国有关官员停止日复一日炮制。Hey, Law Waters! It's Law Waters Six here with another video. Did I scare you there? We can go through some of the most hilarious, my what I think one of the most hilarious topics of China is, and that is wolf warrior diplomacy, or as I like to call it, wolf wanker diplomacy. Now, before we get started, I actually、uh, have a little, another little treat for you guys.、Um, The Wu Mao shirts, the 50 Cent Army covered in blood, dripping down because really they're complicit in some of the most、uh, tragic, cringe material on the internet. The Wu Mao's out there. This shirt is now available again.、Uh, the company that I work with in England,、uh, made in England by the way, the、uh, the company got so many emails from people that wanted the Wu Mao shirt back that they re-released it, and I was like, yeah, let's do it. So that's out for like I think it's only like 11 days or something. So the、uh, the link is down in the description. Wolf warriors. What is a wolf warrior? Well, first off, let's talk about what this term came from. A Zhang Lan Wai Jiao is like a, a wolf warrior diplomacy. It basically means somebody that's going out and being the aggressor in diplomatic relationships, and it comes from somewhere. Unfortunately, it comes from one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life and its sequel, Cold. Wolf warrior. Let's have a little look. Oh, before we do this movie.、Um, Is well known for being a very in-your-face movie. It's very not Chinese. China's always thrived on this whole like China's gonna bide its time. It's the sleeping dragon. You know they don't get in people's faces. They're non-confrontational. All this kind of jazz. But then Wolf Warrior comes out. It kind of started with、uh, Winnie the Pooh's regime, Chairman Chairman Pooh,、uh, for life. There's a new kind of、uh, tactic. It's to get in your face. It's to get in the West's face and be like, "China needs to be paid attention to. China is going to kick your ass. We're awesome." Blah blah blah. 电影，但是我们拒绝任何无端的指责。I have to ask whether you understand China. Have you been to China? Do you know that China has lifted more than 600 million people out of poverty? And do you know that China is now the second largest economy in the world、uh, from a very low foundation? And that's very anti like Chinese culture. It's not how China usually operates. But anyway, they come out with this movie called Wolf Warrior, and it's just this massive patriotic. It's basically a Wu Mao Bible. It's a Bible for all the 50 Cent armies about like, oh yeah, well we're strong now. Oh yeah, well we alleviated poverty. Oh yeah, well we have lots of weapons in our army now. We're gonna beat you up. That's the whole kind of、uh, feeling around the Wolf Warrior movie. Now,、uh, before I play a couple scenes from it, I wanted you guys to know the tagline for Wolf Warrior Two. Which is the sequel, and I kid you not, this is the tagline. Brace yourselves for this. I'm, I'm being serious. Anyone who offends China will be killed, no matter how far the target is. That is the tagline for a Wolf Warrior Two. So you can kind of understand how、uh, how this、uh, this movie plays out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this little clip here. You guys might enjoy this. You can kind of get an idea、uh, for what's happening here. You wanna know what I fight for? Money. The the antagonist here, the Western dude, thinks he's Australian. He said, "Do you you know like your your efforts are are useless to the Chinese soldier?" And he says, "Do you wanna know what I fight for? Money, because he's obviously some mercenary soldier." Now you'd think the reply would be a fight or something, but no, there is a very good,、uh, very honest reply、uh, that's just right, flies right in your face. <laughs> To die for your country. Well, now we know what he fights for. The Chinese soldier.、Uh, he fights for China, and it's written in English on his patch, as as it would for the Chinese army member. I like how that they made made that quote. Obviously, it's very clear. I don't even write film or or anything, but I can I can honestly tell when they were writing this guy's line. They're like, "Do you want to know what I fight for? Money." Then later on, they had this patch made. And they wrote, "I fight for China." Either that, or they they spent money making this patch, saying, "I fight for China," and then made that scene afterwards just for that patch. That's just fascinating to me. Then they go on to fight. Now, and it goes, "You want to die for for your country?" I like this little scene. It flashes back to here, and you can see the the Chinese flag that shimmers in his eyes. It glimmers in his eyes, and he's like, "You know what? I'm gonna muster up all my courage." And he fights this dude. 
So that's Wolf Warrior. It's a little bit of Wolf Warrior. Um, Wolf Warrior also is known for being a mouthy dude. And that's kind of where this whole Wolf Warrior diplomacy thing comes from. Well, the Wolf Warrior character in the movie, he's kind of an asshole. Like he's, he's kind of awful and mean, but people love him for it, you know what I mean? And it's kind of this idea that, and this does happen in China. People in China, because it's a, a collective society, people that stand out from that tend to get rewarded for just being brash and bullish. So like the people in power in China, and if you've been to China, you'd understand this. Uh, the people in power in China basically are very much the bullies, the loud mouths, the spoiled brats of the group. And they just had the balls to stand up and just be loud in front of anyone, push everyone around. And that's kind of what the Wolf Warrior does. And that's just, I, like I said, it's not very Chinese, but it's also it's time and te time and tested, like rewarded in Chinese culture when somebody is an asshole um, in mainland Chinese culture. Just because, unfortunately, that's the nature of the Communist Party of China, that the leadership ladder, the way it works. So he says things like this. So his, his platoon here says, "Why can't a, a woman be a commander? Without our female commander, we would we wouldn't be wolf warriors, right?" They're basically sticking up for her, saying like, "We like our female leadership." Whereas he says, He's very well known for being just uh, brash and in your face and like flying in the face of everything. He's like, you know, a woman, you know, needs to be conquered by a man like me. What a good role model, isn't he? That is Wolf Warrior. And Wolf Warrior was so popular it had ended up having a sequel. It's quite possibly it's one of those things where it's so over the top that it doesn't make me mad because it's so ridiculous, but then you realize how many people actually took it seriously. And that's so sad because China's got so many good films, especially in the 90s, a lot of stuff that was was banned or blocked or you know wasn't allowed to persist. This is the kind of stuff you're left with, just garbage, garbage action films, honestly. Wolf Warrior Diplomacy is when China says enough is enough, instead of being this kind of coy, sly, uh, subdued entity far away, where everyone says, oh, it's just China. Oh, that's just China and slowly grows, which is their 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 strength, by the way. It decides to switch thing up, set things up. FBI said, you can believe it. I'm going to be like a FBI director. And I think this is massively to the detriment of China. When you send your diplomats out to be very, very vocal and make other countries angry and pissed off, it doesn't work on a global scale in terms of winning friends. And that's the problem is China's been trying to uh, increase its influence around the world with the Belt and Road Initiative, trying to get poor countries or underdeveloped countries uh, infrastructure projects in with massive unfair loans or deals or transactions or ports and things so they can expand their navy and army. All of these uh, these countries in the Belt and Road Initiative, when they see actions like Wolf Warrior Diplomacy, all of a sudden China doesn't look like this benef beneficiary country. In the beginning of the Belt and Road, or in the beginning of really China's diplomatic endeavors, um, when I was first in China, China was kind of this, we do our own thing and it's none of your business. And that kind of, I'll be honest with you, it kind of worked. China still had horrific human rights atrocities when I was there. But it also was a marginally more free society in terms of like when I first got there, the internet was pretty much unblocked. Uh, you go on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all those kind of things. It was a more free society because it operated in China's gray area. It was still an authoritarian dictatorship, but at least there was workings and cogs moving around within the Communist Party of China. There was there was competition within there, right? Now we just have dictator for life and everything kind of changed. That trajectory of China kind of biding its time, doing its own thing. I think they really jumped the gun way too fast when they when they had Xi Jinping come into power because now it's it's all about China's China first. China's going to kick your ass. Look at your stagnating bullshit country. Look at how how much you're failing. It is not winning any friends. So you had this, especially during the Trump administration during the trade war. You had this kind of fighting back with wolf warrior diplomacy where they would hit back, and. Unfortunately, they hit back all over the board. It wasn't just at America, it's like all across the board. And it did not win any friends. And unfortunately now for China, I think that's it's really gonna bite back because there's more of, I've never seen such a unilateral support for, for criticism of the CCP as I do now. Um, it makes me happy to see that there's some pushback. 
I do, you can talk about whatever you want, you know, like corrupt countries still buying into China or the EU trade deal or Biden's past relationships. You can talk about all this kind of stuff, but unilaterally, like if you talk about the whole, the whole global picture, there's never been more criticism of the CCP than there has been now. And that's because of things like the Wolf Warrior diplomacy stuff. These are your top three wolf wanker uh, diplomats here. We have Hua Chunying, which is on the left. Um, Hua Chunying is probably someone you recognize from news articles, probably someone that you've seen before. Uh, we have Zhao Lijian, who's the guy in the middle. And then uh, we have uh, Liu Xiaoming. One of his most famous uh, uh, endeavors here was when he literally came out and said, it might be the US Army who brought the epidemic to Wuhan and blamed the US military on bringing the uh, COVID-19 to, to Wuhan, which did not win him any favors. He said, be transparent, make public your data, make public your data. US owe us an ex explanation, probably run that through Grammarly or something. Shout out to uh, Grammarly if you ever want to give me a sponsor. <laughs> uh, but Zhao Lijian should probably think about using Grammarly. Now, uh, Hua Chunying, who's this woman right here, she uh, she's good buddies, of course, with Zhao Lijian. She famously got very uh, a ton of hate when this happened. Uh, this woman named Morgan Ortega said something about uh, standing up to the Chinese Communist Party, to which Hua Chunying, right at the height of the BLM protest, said, I can't breathe. And that did not win her any favors, to tell you that. That did not win her any favors. By the way, uh, my coworker, Serpent Zede, he has been blocked by Hua Chunying, even though he's never tweeted at her, which I find absolutely hilarious. I might be blocked now too, I'm not sure. But I've never tweeted at her either. But uh, she, she goes on to say things like, we firmly oppose the US that tarnishes China's name. And she goes on the offense. She's a typical wolf anchor diplomat. Um, US should be condemned and held accountable for, for such egregious acts. Uh, she's definitely one of the more vocal ones out there. She gets in Twitter feuds with people all the time, but she's out there, you know, representing China's foreign minister of affairs. I, I just can't believe that that's their, their representative. Also, she claims to speak fluent English um, and she actually has a degree in English. That's her whole thing, but I've never heard her speak English. So it'd be interesting. I don't know why she's always speaking Chinese in these things. You'd think that, uh, you know, she would be using a language that would be more potent for the foreign audience that she's trying to coerce into believing China soft power. Um, now, I I don't know what to say about this, but my buddy Jordan Harbinger, he actually, he has a theory, well, at least he thinks that Hua Chunying may actually not be a, a woman. I don't, personally, Jordan, I don't think that matters, all right? If you guys remember this Austin Powers scene where it's a man baby comes into play. That's not your mother, it's a man baby! Yeah, no. yeah. Come on! Um, he's convinced that she may be a man with a wig on. Uh, that is neither here nor there. We're not, I'm not sure about that. But, it, you know, maybe at some point it'll come to fisticuffs on a stage here during one of these, uh, these speeches and people will actually find out if there's a wig or not. Uh, Leo Xiaoming, you guys will know him as the guy that, like I said, liked the uh, porn tweet on Twitter. Uh, very funny. He's the Chinese ambassador to the UK. He um, liked some some sort of porn tweet that was on, on Twitter. Uh, I guess he didn't think people could see what he liked. And then he and the Chinese government decided to label that action as out, outside forces that are trying to smear China's reputation. Of course, of course that happened. Um, and that turned into a massive meme. That was very, very funny. But he's well known for just being a real, a real d-bag to everybody. This guy, uh, the German foreign, uh, the German foreign uh, office tweeted this out, talking about the presidential election in the U.S. And his name's Chen Weihua. He replied with the effing Moss, which is this this guy's name, Heiko Moss, who was talking about the the election. This wolf warrior just went full on just using bad language, which is quite rare to see. Usually you see people just being like, like cheeky, like saying like, I can't breathe or, you know, like, how dare you do this kind of stuff. But he just goes out there. This is probably one of my favorites. Senator Marsha Blackburn said, China has a 5,000 year of cheating and stealing. Some things never, will never change. And then he replies, bitch, this is the most racist and ignorant US Senator I've seen. Lifetime bitch. <laughs> so he just went out there. He went all in. That's a really good example of, of Wolf Wanker diplomacy. Now all these guys, to tie back to this whole movie thing, 
their job is to go out there and make China not lose face. And unfortunately, I just think that they're doing the, the polar opposite. These wolf wankers are literally doing the thing that they set out not to do. When China bides its time, people don't pay attention and deals can be struck. This is my theory. Deals can be struck when China's in the background. Um, you know, infrastructure projects can go. Heck, the B Belt and Road Initiative probably wouldn't even been such a big talking point if China wasn't being so vocal under its current leadership. And I'm saying this, I'm happy that it's coming to light and I'm happy that they're using wolf wankers, if I'm totally honest, because it makes very transparent what the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party, what their goals are. But it is not winning any favors. And China's always been in this kind of very isolationist uh, situation, except when I was in China, like when all these businesses were opening up and corporations and cooperative uh, uh, business trade agreements and all this kind of stuff. It was really blossoming in China because China was uh, number one, pretty untouched and number two, pretty, pretty open with what you could do. And now that's just not the case. Now China is a massive abuser of human rights. Um, literally trying to coerce you know foreign governments and foreign people to to adhere to its system that it has in china uh brainwashing mass surveillance hacking spy everything that you can imagine it's it's come to the forefront of what china's true goals actually are at this point and like i said i'm thankful for the wolf wankers because it gives us a little bit of transparency into what china's doing at the same time it's hugely detrimental to the future of of china's and you know role in the world because even, this is the thing, is that China thinks that it's got all these countries in its pocket. South American countries, African countries, all these countries is building bridges in. It's uh, having language exchanges with all this kind of stuff, diplomacy. The people of that country, unfortunately, don't have the same cultural exports as they do get from America or the UK or whatever. China does not export anything cool. So the average people on the ground in these countries are not consuming Chinese things. They're be maybe beneficiaries of some of these hollow projects that China pushes on their country, but they still, at the end of the day, blame China for the for COVID-19. They still blame China for a lot of their problems, and uh, you know maybe their future, you know, democratic institutions being tarnished because China is too involved in their country and politics. Um, it's getting a lot of pushback even amongst cons you know what China considers allies like Pakistan and stuff. And unfortunately, China's just not waited long enough to, to be a cultural import or um, hasn't waited long enough to ha command the respect of most countries around the world. And that's what, what China's strong suit was, is that it could kind of just chill in the background and get rich. Uh, and it, honestly, like a lot of the world would, would have completely ignored a lot of the human rights abuses that it does to its domestic populace and ignore a lot of its global ambitions if China was was just a little more quiet about it, but unfortunately it just didn't work out like that. China's, the thing about Chinese culture, especially in mainland China, is losing face is just so important uh, to, to everyone. Like if you lose face on a global scale, then you can't justify this authoritarian government to your own populace. So it's a tricky balance. So like this kind of gray zone that China's floating and coasting on, when you have a situation where you need to institute more authoritarian measures or more oppressive natures, uh, you know, a more oppressive nature to, uh, to your people, where you really have to crack down on people's freedom and, and freedom of speech and their ability to communicate with the outside world. When you have to do this more and more, in order for the people not to question you, you have to make sure that they have your respect, right? So if you have a country where China is kind of like, I'm gonna go out there and just kind of stay silent when the rest of the world kind of looks like they're either trying to take advantage of me or they don't respect me, at the same time, I got to kind of institute a lot of surveillance on my citizens so they don't start questioning the way that we run them. In order to stop that or quash that conversation, China needs to command respect around the world. And what they do is, you know, they're not using these wolf wanker diplomats for our benefit. Like we were looking at these and being like, what absolute dirtbags. But for the domestic public, when these tweets get kind of, uh, or the, the messages at least get translated over for the domestic populace, you know, the a good chunk of the Chinese population will sit there and be like, oh yeah, we got this, you know, we did this, we were so awesome. Like, look at our diplomats, they're actually sticking up to the Trumps of the world or whatever, the, the dip other diplomats of the world. And that's kind of where this came about. Um, but I really don't think it's gonna be conducive to China's China's respect in the future from other countries. Uh, Taiwan hit back, which is hilarious. This is Xiao Mei Qin. She's like the representative for the, uh, what's it called, like the, American delegation or whatever. She kind of represents Taiwan to America. Uh, Xiao Mei Qin, she, call, she called Taiwan's diplomacy cat warrior diplomacy instead of uh, wolf warrior diplomacy because cats are flexible and 
they have agility. So they're able to, to change to every situation. And she focuses on positivity and make sure that Taiwan is a, a positive force around the world, especially in a, such a toxic time, right? So I thought that was hilarious. She's, she's the true warrior in this situation. You can say that people are in China's pockets or vice versa, but at the end of the day, when there's too much on the table, when there's too many things to answer for, like a Hong, what happened in Hong Kong, completely, when a country like China shows that they, they can completely shred up an agreement like they had with the UK with Hong Kong, to give them 50 years autonomy and they just rip that up and like basically spit at the world and say, we can do whatever we want. We're gonna absorb uh, Hong Kong into the, the sphere to completely destroy their democracy and then use police brutality against anyone that says otherwise, even though it's not their territory to, to claim uh, in terms of the law, institute very, very punishing and horrible laws that make it almost worse in some places in mainland China. When you do things like that, the world will they will notice and they're gonna say, why would I invest in a country like this? Like this, is, it's a country that has a government. The country might be fine, but the government that represents the people and represents business and transactions and all this kind of stuff, international law, doesn't honor contracts. It doesn't honor agreements. Why would I deal with a country like that? So when something like that happens and then you have COVID-19, when the whole cover up happened, when you have a country's government to blame for why it was released to the rest of the world because of mismanagement and censorship, that's not a good look either. Then you get, you just get so many other situations where like um, like the Xinjiang concentration camps. You literally have concentration camps right now or re-education concentration camps with millions of, of these ethnic Uyghur Muslim people in camps doing forced labor um, with evidence coming out now saying that uh, there's, there's actual like in government initiatives trying to get them to make confessional tapes about how much they love China and how like they're not being forced to do this kind of stuff. Um, we might cover that on the podcast tomorrow. With all of these modern day atrocities, it's just too much, it's too much at once. Like people are talking about China now for the wrong reasons. The, the whole idea that China was you know, combating COVID-19 and the savior of the world, it didn't work out. Like at the end of the day, most of the people around the world have a very negative taste about China in their mouth now because of the pandemic and can currently still do. Um, and it doesn't matter how much blame they can put on other political leaders or other countries people have a more negative view of China because of this. And that's that's unfortunate. It's just the way things are gonna be for a very long time, unless there's some sort of uh, reset in the way that China is trying to, to deal with the rest of the world. Don't forget the Wu Mao t-shirts, uh, links below, 11 days left on that bad boy. Um, I hope you guys love these. I've These are great, great quality t-shirts. They're awesome. And you, I've had a lot of people ask me, they're like, are people gonna get mad? Are Chinese people gonna get mad if they see me wear this t-shirt? This is not an offensive thing. Wu Mao will only be offensive to Wu Maos, <laughs> right? So as long as they're not actually a Wu Mao, then they shouldn't be offended. And if they are a Wu Mao, that's great if they're offended. You're doing your part. You're doing your part out there. In fact, some of the biggest buyers of the Wu Mao t-shirts are Chinese people, in fact, because they like to go out there on the offense as well. Wolf warriors. Let's all be wolf warriors, guys. Let's all be wolf wankers together. Thank you to all my patrons out there that actually gave me this idea. Patron.com slash lawai86. Uh, you guys, I wouldn't be here without your support. The amount of times we get demonetized and stuff. Patrons are one of our only fallbacks, so I really appreciate it.